for the Lord Jesus a wonderful round of applause. My dear brethren, we will have a festival of blessings here today. Today will be a day of many wonders indeed, because God will stretch out his beautiful hand and he will operate. I would like you to open your Bibles now to 2 Kings 6.3. The message is, uh, when the prophet Elisha said yes to a request, and whenever we are being questioned by anyone, and we feel that it's actually God's direction, we must also say yes. Because if God is making a plan and is carrying it out, and we do not take a stand in such plan, we may become a hindrance to God's plan or thwart his plan. It is thus written, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, it's verse number one, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. So he answered, Go. Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. Let's look at this. They wanted to make an improvement where they were living so that they could become more comfortable. A beam is a long piece of wood. They asked for his consent. He was a prophet, a servant of God. And he said, You're allowed to go. But one of them was kinder. Please consent to go with your servants. He felt that that might become necessary. And Elisha felt that too. Yes, I will go with you. He said yes. Sometimes people hinder the plans of the Lord when people entreat him out of fear. Then they become afraid to go, but they must go. Some people don't do this, but God was telling them to go. You must obey the Lord, but when we feel it is from God, we must say yes. And while they were cutting the wood, someone's axe fell into the water, and he said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. Elisha saw it because God showed it to him. Where did it sink over there? He cut off a stick, blessed it, and tossed it. And he removed the law of gravity from that lake. The iron axe floated. He said, you can pick it up now, and the man picked it up. In other words, that young man had an experience. God was glorified because one of them invited the prophet, and the prophet didn't say no. Put that in your heart. Close your eyes now. God, how many times... Have we been in trouble in our lives because we haven't given heed to your word? That ax would never have resurfaced upon the lake if the prophet weren't there. It would have been a great damage to that young man who were no resources at all. Sometimes it's in someone's life, God, or their marriage, or their company. And people ask a pastor or a brother to pray for them, but they refuse to pray by giving you an excuse. Have mercy, God. Father, I'm going to bless everyone who needs a prayer right now. In the name of our Lord Jesus, I send all evil away. Do not come back again in the holy name of the Lord. And you say, Amen. Oh, glory to God. Let's do the following, brethren. Let's watch a beautiful miracle that happened in a small city in Hibedon Pires in Sao Paulo. Let's watch this together in the name of the Lord. What is your name? Judésia. What was your problem, ma'am? The doctor said that I suffered from gout. This ankle hurt so bad that I couldn't walk for three months. Today I ordained that I would come here to seek my blessing. Show me how you were limping. Show me how you were walking. I was walking like this when I arrived. For how long? Five months? Three months. Three months. Three months. Walk normally now, sister. Look at that, brethren. <laughs> come over here, sister. Come here. Did it hurt when you did that? No, it didn't hurt. Are you free now? I'm free. You are Thanks free be now to in God. the name of Jesus. Let's applaud for Jesus. Our God is awesome. Pay close attention. She said she was determined to go there and she would be healed. But what if I had thought, should I preach at such a small place? I have other things to do today. I would be making a huge mistake. God had inspired me. I delivered the word. When we deliver the word, we simply cannot ever allow anything to lead us astray from the holy word of God unless we feel that comes from God. Obviously, if people speak inadvertently, my brethren, then that person must stop right there and think, maybe I shouldn't have said that. My brother, please forgive me. But when they speak God's words, 
you can be certain that God will bless them in the holy name of Jesus. Amen? Speaking of God's words, let's watch another miracle that the Lord Jesus performed. Let's watch this video together in the name of Jesus. The orthopedist told me that my tendon is completely ruptured and because of my age, I can't be operated on or I'd lose my arm. So I said, well, I was going to travel yesterday, but I said, no, tomorrow I will seek my healing. Was it worthwhile? Look, Look at, at this, that, doctor. doctor. Look at Look that. At this. God has healed you, sister. Yes, he Jesus, has. Jesus, thank you so much. For a long time, because I worked all my life carrying heavy things, and one year ago it got worse. It took a turn to the worse? It hurt so much, and my clavicle hurts too. It used to hurt, actually. When I went to bed or when I turned in bed, I had to hold my arm with the other hand and turn because, because I just couldn't lift my arm. So I said, so I said, well, Dr. Sawadis will be here on the 23rd and on the 22nd I will travel, so what do I do? And I felt something in my heart. I can travel some other time, so I will seek my healing. I came to seek my healing. Oh, my sister, I can raise my arm now. Glory to God, when I did this, it would hurt a lot. Ouch, it hurts, but not anymore. Now look, 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 look. It's a new life now, sister. God mended my tendon. God restored it. He made it brand new, brethren. <laughs> you may postpone anything at all, but not being in God's presence. You may miss anything in life, but don't miss out on his presence. Don't let temptation overwhelm you. Don't become discouraged. You've been called to become a blessing in the name of Jesus. And now let's go to the 119th Psalm first, and then we'll look at 2 Corinthians. The verse is number 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Some people say how I love the Lord, but oftentimes they're telling a lie, a barefaced lie as a matter of fact. And why would, why would people tell such a lie? Because they don't have the commandments and don't keep them. Pay close attention to this word. Jesus said in John 14, 21, He who has my commandments and keeps them, my brethren, it is he who loves me. The psalmist wasn't lying. It's written in the Holy Bible. It's the word of the Holy Spirit. He reached such a level that we must also set as our goal so that we may reach it as well, and then we are able to say how I love the Lord God, the law of the Lord, the gospel and the Lord's holy word so that we may obey his word. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, starting with verse number 1. Here the Apostle Paul explains the following. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. My brethren, let me explain this. Why did they receive it? Because they heard God's word. Why does God give you the grace of doing something for the benefit of the gospel? Something on behalf of someone. The Lord God gives you such grace because he has a purpose. And if you take this commandment and fulfill it, then you will have achieved that level of loving God. Those who love God are loved by him. That is, you fulfill a commandment and he will fulfill his promise. And they are loved by Jesus as well. And Jesus said, I will manifest to them. So Paul said, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. This grace is upon your life now. If the devil's been surrounding you with a threat and you already feel the symptoms, you feel you're under attack, my brethren, it's time for you to believe in this meeting and pray because God wants to operate in your life. He bestowed grace upon the churches of Macedonia. And if they hadn't have received such grace, they would have missed out on their blessing. If you don't take the grace that God is giving to you, you will miss out on your blessing. And then God won't be able to do anything on your behalf. Which grace was that? That in a great trial of affliction, it wasn't just a little trial, the abundance of their joy, of their gladness, of their pleasure, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So pay close attention here, brethren. Let's understand this verse. They were in a great trial of affliction. 
The trial of affliction comes not only to the poor, it comes to the rich as well. And this great trial comes to people who are not famous and people who are famous, like the grace of God. So many artists, politicians, businessmen watch the faith show and are blessed. I know of a person, because a friend once told me, he's very big in the entrepreneurial world, and he told me of a great miracle he saw on the program, but he's never had the courage to set foot here. Of course, it's a humble place, but it's the house where the Lord blesses you. It's the manger of Jesus. It's necessary. You have to come seek the Lord because God's given you grace and you have benefited from it. But if you don't fulfill what grace is saying to you, you will miss out. The churches of Macedonia were in great trial of affliction. It wasn't something easy. And what else? That in a great trial of affliction, Dr. Suarez, I'm in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. In trials, we have to have abundance of joy. I always say you can't keep a sullen demeanor towards the Word of God. You have to be always ready for what God will operate in your life. You have to have the stance of a soldier. Today, you need to learn what the Lord is saying. I prophesied it today. Someone with a serious problem, you haven't felt it, but I have. At that moment, I know that message reached someone, and they're feeling every one of the symptoms of diseases. What should this person do? Believe because grace is upon them. Grace is the moving of God to destroy all evil. But if you were not tuned in, I'm sorry. I just can't say, John, hey, John, I'm talking to you. God used me. I felt that it was a prophecy. I delivered it. And when I do that, I'm quite sure God has operated and is operating. The abundance of their joy. There must be abundance of the joy the Lord gave to you. Abundance. It's not just a wry smile, no, but true, genuine joy, happiness with the Lord. If you don't have the Lord, you will never be blessed because we must serve the Lord with joy. He doesn't tell us to serve Him with sadness. If you don't have joy, you must have. You're being religious. You are trying to do God's things in your own terms. It didn't work before, it's not working, and it will never work. Do the things according to what God says. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. God is giving you this gift, this grace of planting and reaping, of being able to bring into existence that which didn't exist in your life. God's proposing a new life for you. He's vivified you in Christ, but not for you to lag behind in the gospel, but for you to prosper and become a real blessing. Not for you to be that kind of Christian that finds fault in everyone, but to be a kind of Christian who fixes the faults of others. Verse number three now. Why? According to their ability. God has given you power, but you shall receive the virtue of power from the Holy Spirit. Yes, it shall come upon you. Maybe you are having serious problems in your life or with your family, but you can't solve it. You're not paying attention. Something quite simple is missing in your life. It's a light that shines, that voice that speaks. It speaks to your ears. Oh, Lord, I get it. It's not to your ears, actually, but to your spirit. For I bear witness that according to their ability, Paul said that it was true. Yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. The issue here is they had to further God's work in Judea. They were in deep poverty, but they heard God speaking, and they gave with power, with the ability they had, beyond their ability. And they did so because of the gift of liberality, my brethren, that the Lord had put deep within their hearts. That is, the Lord will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will also reap. When God gives you a blessing, my brethren, that is when you have to take possession of this blessing. They were freely willing, imploring us with, pay attention to that people's spirit. They begged, imploring us with urgency. It was urgent for them that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. They understood and said, Paul, will you please take it to Jerusalem because God's work needs it? And Paul did that. 
My brethren, what just happened here? It's not for us to praise them. They proved that they loved the Lord. Saying that one loves God is very easy. But those who have the commandments, the positive or negative ones, do this and don't do that, and keep them, they do love the Lord. And not the ones that keep, they keep saying, I love you, I adore you, I adore you, you are very important. And they sing, and they sing wonderfully, and I want to stand up above everyone. But they don't do. They don't accomplish what God commands. It can't be different. When you do, you prove your love. You are loved by God. You are loved and will be loved by Jesus. And Jesus will manifest himself to you more often. I don't need a church full of troubles. I want a church full of people who prosper, who are saints, people who do the work of God, people who won't have problems on the day of reckoning. On that very day, of course, people will bow down their heads as a sign of respect, and we will surely be rewarded for our faith in the name of the Lord Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8.4, imploring us with urgency. Paul took it. What did they do? They fulfilled the word that God had given to them. You see, brethren, let us pray now. God, thank you so much. I join my faith with the faith of these people. And I say now to the spirit of disease, hey, demon, you don't have the authorization to touch these people's lives. But I do give you an authorization for you to leave this very moment and never come back again. It's not just an authorization, it's an order. It's a demand. Leave and take the stones from these people's kidneys. I've caught you now, demon. I've found you. And I command you right now to leave this kidney, the one with the stone. And and leave the other, leave their gallbladder demon. Leave now, because I command you, I am ordaining you, I am demanding. Leave their eyesight demon, leave their ears, their minds, leave their marrow. You have reduced their white blood cells. I'm not just asking, I'm giving you an order. In the name of the Lord Jesus, go away with all of your evil, no matter what evil it may be. I command you, I demand you to leave in the name of the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And amen. Oh, glory to God. And now let's go to the real life drama segment. I accepted Jesus at the beginning of 2000. My husband had depression after he arrived from a trip. I couldn't be in enclosed areas. I couldn't leave home. I wouldn't even go to the grocery store, which is a few meters from my house. I had to take medications. We had boxes of medicine at home. We couldn't afford them. Money wasn't enough and we had bills to pay. We paid one but not the other the following month. We paid some but left others unpaid. It became a snowball even though we were tithing. I wanted to change but I just didn't know how. We lacked the understanding. We had to understand it wasn't God doing that but rather the enemy in action. A friend told me about the faith show. I started to watch it because uh, because I because I didn't have understanding of what was going on with me. I started to seek and the word that the pastor preached began to, to bring peace, bring comfort in my life, and most importantly, the correct understanding. God doesn't make anyone sick. He doesn't want anyone poor or going through hardships, right? I was called to be a sponsor before I joined the Grace of God Church. He sponsored, and later, a few years later, I sponsored as well. That money was being used in God's work, right? We saw that on TV every day. Dr. Suarez preaching the word, helping so many people. So it moved us very deeply. 
It's important to know that we are investing in a tree that is bearing fruit. We sponsored for eight years. We sponsored without being members of the Grace of God Church. We went to another evangelical church. My life started to change at the moment that I heard a message from Dr. Suarez, you know, and I remember that he was, that he was preaching about, about John. And he quoted John 10, 10, the thief does not come here except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said that I have come to give you life and life abundantly. That passage, that verse was really engraved in my heart. It said, I said to me, wow, Jesus said that he didn't come here to bring suffering or any kind of suffering, to bring poverty or to bring diseases. Just came to bring life, an abundant life. So I started to roam from church to church, looking for a place until I found the International Grace of God Church here in my city. Every doubt that we had about God's Word started to clarify. We had put it into practice and God started to change everything in our life. My husband had had panic syndrome. He was delivered, completely delivered. I went back to being smiling as always. I went back to being happy and peaceful and I wasn't unhealthy anymore. Our financial life started to improve. I was already working at that time. Today, I'm no longer an employee. I'm self-employed. I'm a computer technician. In May last year, I started to save some money because we needed to have a car. We only had a motorcycle, and God showed me that I had to increase my sponsorship. And at that time, I wasn't exactly able to afford it. But I said, Lord, if you're speaking to me, you have, you have much more to give me. And then in September, God gave us a car. God prepared everything. I paid for it in a lump sum. And thank God today we have a car, a motorcycle, and the most important thing, God's blessing and the right understanding of his word. Today we know that we can live a different life with Jesus using the word of God and overcoming all the battles that come our way. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. My brethren, we are able to prove that we love God when we respond to the Lord's grace. God hasn't granted you his grace for you to continue to be the same person you were before you found out about the gospel. Maybe before you received God's grace, you were deep in debt, and if you continue, what really changed? Maybe you were behaving in such a manner that was contrary to good morals. What really changed in your life? What are you doing with your life? Or do you think the Lord is happy about that? Our role model is the Lord Jesus. We must focus on his word because it teaches us how to be the individuals that the Lord wants us to be here in our generation. There's no need to wait to serve God in heaven. It's right now. Those who don't serve him now won't go there. People who deny Jesus right now, those who are shy of claiming what God gives to them, will not go to heaven. It's in Revelation 21.8. They will not enter. They will have the second death. We have no choice. God speaks to us. He gives us his grace. And my brethren, even if we are very poor of gifts and abilities, as long as we remain firm, God will surely put his power into our hands and we will become a great blessing that the Lord needs us to be. The world needs it. The gospel needs it. Prosperous people of well-off people, of people who have been healed, that are, that are joyful, of our conquerors actually, mainly if you are holy and full of the Holy Spirit of God, without any works of the devil in your life, but full of the divine grace. And now let's go to the question and answer segment. How can we minister God's word to the terminally ill? In the same exact way when we minister it to those who have no diseases. We want those who are ill to be healed, or we want them to be saved. But sometimes the terminally ill have more life than even a young man or a young lady that are full of life who may have a sudden illness and die, all of a sudden. One day while going to Brasilia from Campo Grande, a young lady sat by my side. She said, it's good to sit by your side. I need an explanation because I was 12 days away from my wedding day. I had a wonderful fiance. He was strong and handsome and healthy but he died in his sleep. I said, I have no explanation to give, only God does. The terminally ill, they must know that they are dying, that is true. But those who are healthy, they must know too. We don't know, we're not God, to know when a person is going to die. Second question. Dr. Suarez, should we tithe on inheritance money? My dear sister, we must tithe on everything that the Lord gives us. But let me tell you something that may help you. Suppose you bought an apartment for $200,000. 
And the housing market's improved and you sold it for 300. What is the tithe? 30? No, 10. Your profit was 100,000. We have to teach that which is right. Let's suppose the owner of a store, he bought a product for 10 and sold it for 13, but he tithes on 130. No, he'll tithe on the profit he had. Income minus expenses is profit. God only wants what's real. Lies are not for God. Now let's watch the Open Your Heart segment. Dr. Swadis, I have been going through hard times with my children. One of them opened a gym, but he complains about not having any members. But I notice he has money, which he spends on other things and lets the rent and other bills become past due. To make my situation worse, he bought a car using my name and now I'm the one who pays for it. All he wants is to hang out with friends and come home late at night. My other son is involved in homosexual activity and no matter how much he strives, he can't be free from it. He wants to go to church, but he lacks strength to do it. He's always been a nice and humble young man, but he is becoming rebellious and sad. He argues with everyone. Dr. Suarez, I don't know what to do. I need your guidance. God's already given you his guidance today. In 2 Corinthians, it's written that in a great trial of tribulation, some people have financial tribulation, others have moral issues, some have health issues. My dear brethren, the world is being attacked by the devil every day. In the book of Revelation, it is written, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. It's time for you to seek the Lord. It's time to get rid of any grudge, any resentment, any bad feelings deep within your heart and stand firmly on the word of God and seek him until your problem is solved. Do that, sister, because God is Father. God used me today. And I said from the beginning that God was speaking to someone and the word is going to be very useful for you. May God use you a lot and let's keep on fighting together so that our victory will be complete. If only we remain firm until the very end. Let me pray for those who are at home. God... We're drawing near to the end of the program. But before that, God, as you said at the beginning of the program, I'm sure it was addressed to all of these people and they've received it. I agree with them. I ordain right now that all the evil works that are present in their lives be destroyed. And I say, devil, gather all of your afflictions. Go away in the name of the Lord Jesus. Nope. Mm -hmm.